fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back. This is uh, KFNX 1100 uh, Independent Talk Radio Phoenix. And uh, on the House of Mystery, we have a follow-up guest, John Cameron, who is the author of It's Me, and it's about Edward Wayne Edwards, and uh, he's a serial killer that you uh, probably never heard of. Well, lately you might have. Um, so it's kind of a follow-up interview where we're doing a lot of the questions we got in from the uh, first interview, which was uh, widely received. Um, thank you for coming back. Well, thanks for having me back, Alan. That was a great interview last time, and uh, I think people are starting to, to listen and watch and hear about Mr. Edwards. Nobody ever heard of him, and suddenly <laughs> it seems lots of people are starting to, to hear about him. Yeah, and that's that's really cool, actually, because I hadn't heard of him. Um, I, I had talked to um, Dave Schrader, of course, Darkness Dave from Minneapolis, and I know he had had you on for the book before all the Steve Avery and uh, that's kind of when I thought well you know because we cover true crime that's that was kind of my intention and it just tied in at the same time as all the Steve Avery things so um, it was all accident so I, I, that's good it makes for a good interview uh, so uh, let's let's talk about that this uh, for the people that haven't listened to the first one and uh, don't know much about it let's kind of lay the groundworks of uh, Edward Wayne Edwards. Sure, I'll tell you all about Edward Wayne Edwards. Um, I'm a I'm a retired police detective from Montana, and I ended up investigating for the past six years um, after he got caught at the age of 76 for his first murder. And my investigation showed that Mr. Edwards had started killing when he was 12 in 1945, and killed all the way up until 2009 in his capture in Wisconsin for a double murder. And his whole entire MO was to kill people and set people up. And also portray himself as a happily married family man with kids and a wife. And his ruse was to approach people as a doctor, a preacher, a retired police officer, one of the most trusting people. And he'd gain access into his victims. And then he'd kill someone close to them and set them up. So that's kind of what Edward Edwards' MO was through my investigation was to groom his way into the lives of people, kill somebody, and set someone up close to that person, and stand back and watch, and be in front of everybody under assumed identity when he did it. All right, sounds like a you know he sounded like a real sick guy, you know. Um, <laughs> I, so, how did this tie into the uh, latest making a murderer, Steve Avery? Like, how did you um, all of a sudden pull yourself to the attention of that? What what drew you to it? Well, I published my book, which is really an investigation of his life. It contains all of his records and his letters he sent and all of the evidence that I had to, to attach him to these murders. And uh, really what drew me to the Steve Avery case, uh, I published my book two years ago and never heard of Steve Avery until somebody contacted me recently and told me that, that, that I need to watch Making of a Murder um, on Netflix because uh, it appears that it's a setup done by Mr. Edwards that that came from people that had read my book and had been on my website. And all of the makings of what Edwards did were in that documentary. So I decided to turn it on on Christmas Eve. And uh, by the fourth, fifth episode, uh, there was no doubt that that was a Mr. Edward Edwards setup um, that he had probably planned for a couple of years in advance. And uh, that's how all his setups would play out. That's amazing. What did you find were the... Um similarities like what um, what were the most common things that he did that um, that you found about this case well mr. Edwards was a ritual killer and he killed by rope 
by knife, by gun, by fire. And that's all based on ancient Egyptian uh, history and religion and, and somewhat Satanism. And what he would do is groom his way into the lives of people as the most charming man and then kill them, strangle them, stab them, shoot them, burn them, sometimes cannibalize them, sometimes blow their bodies to parts, um, but always would uh, have a pre-planned plan as to what he was going to do with the body once he killed them. Most of the people that he did kill had no idea they were even going to be shot or they were going to be killed, most of them. Um, many did, but uh, like in the case of Teresa Halbach with the Savory Elvich, she, she probably never even saw it coming. So, I mean, that's at least one thing you can say that's good that she didn't see it coming. But uh, the man is a horrible man, and he groomed his way into his victims, set people up his whole life. And when I found him in the documentary, Making a Murderer, and found all the symbolism of killing by rope, by knife, by gun, by fire on Halloween, and killing a very religious uh, woman who attended a Catholic church. That that was Edward Namo. And it started to play out early on in the documentary when the prosecutor actually in the court stated that Teresa was killed by rope, by knife, by gun, and by fire. And I couldn't believe I was hearing it, because that's what Edwards had done his whole life, and that's throughout my book. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, were you able to, um, since then, get a better um, clarification? Were you able to identify... Uh, that person in, I believe it was episode six of Making a Murderer, wasn't it? Well, yeah, let me just tell the listeners that there's an episode six, and that's uh, 1233 in the the video. You'll see an older man standing by the courthouse door wearing a blue sweater, standing with his arms straight down, standing behind the prosecutor, Mr. Kratz, and he's just staring at the camera for about five seconds, and then that's the end of the shot. He appears to be given the bird with his left hand pointing down, and that's kind of what Edward Nemo would be throughout life. He would kill somebody, he would set people up, and then he would attend the funerals and the trials and the public gatherings. He would actually, you know, search for the bodies of his own victims unbeknownst to the police and always be right in front of people as the nicest helper. You know, uh, one of the most common um, responses to the first episode was about his age and about... Um, at 72, it seemed to be people a lot thought were he was too old to plan and set it all up. And the other thought was that being 72, he was too old to carry it out uh, because he's an old man type thing was kind of the response. That, I'm going to let you answer that. Um, yeah, a lot of that comes from the videos of Mr. Edwards. So when people usually hear of him, they hear of him through a, some type of Internet or something, they immediately go on the Internet and they find his videos. And here you got this man in 2010 who's confessing to five murders that are horrible. And he looks like he couldn't harm anybody. And that really was part of his ruse in the last uh, 10 years of his life. He had two different lives. He was married. He stayed with his wife. He looked like an invalid. He looked like he couldn't walk. He pretended like he was, you know, just decrepit, but he never was. That was all the ruse so that whenever anybody would look at him, they would think he's harmless, and that's what everybody thought when he got caught for murder. But you have to understand that uh, any 72-year-old could kill somebody, actually. Uh, you know, I hang out at this coffee shop here in Great Falls, and there's all these men that hang down there about that age, and I always ask them, so you think you could uh, pull this one off? And there's no doubt every one of them could, you know. Just yeah. because we're old men, we're not capable We're not, not capable of killing, and uh, Mr. Edwards pulled the ruse really well to make people think he was just old and decrepit, but he was actually brilliant. And so it's really easy to kill when you're getting your victims to come to you. He doesn't have to jump out of his car and run after somebody and grab them. They all came to him, every one of them. And so uh, that's yeah. how good he was. Yeah, and I, I sort of believe that, too. I know, I know tons of people. 72 is not that old nowadays. Um, so I kind of... No, it's only 17 years away from me. <laughs> <laughs> it goes fast, I'll tell you. Um, I, you know, so, I, yeah, I kind of... But, I, you know, it's amazing because I've, I've got well over 100 responses with the age thing, one or the other, you know, uh, either mentally or physically. Well, this, uh, 
to give you an idea, you know, I went out to Wapaw, Wisconsin three months ago to interview another man that uh, Edward set up in prison named Christopher Coleman. He's actually in a prison right next door to Mr. Avery. And Edward set him up in 2009 for killing his wife and uh, three kids. But while I was at the prison, Edwards had actually been in that same prison when he was caught. So here we have Edwards in the same prison that um, Chris Coleman is in, and next door we have Steve Avery. They're all in the same place at almost the same time before Edwards died. And all of the uh, the jail people and inmates, and I've gotten uh, emails from people that work in the prison, say what Edwards would do is he forced the prison to push him around in a wheelchair like he was the king. And then when they got to his door, he'd just stand up and walk to his bed. And he was never unable to walk. But it was that's what he was. He was glorious. He felt he was God when he killed because he got away with it so much and was able to set people up. So in the end of his life, here he is in prison, being treated like royalty, being pushed around in a chariot, basically, and appearing to be a harmless old man, but it was all really a ruse. And, and that kind of leads me to another, that, um, you know, how many people did he kill that you think? Or uh, the reason is, is because one of the other big questions we got in here was, um, why hasn't uh, he been talked about like other serial killers? Like Edward a- Wayne Edwards is not like a a common name, or certainly not up to all this happenings lately. Um, so a lot of the questions I've got were, why haven't I ever heard of this guy if he's been a serial killer for so many years? Yeah, that's why I titled the book. It's me, Edward Wayne Edwards, the serial killer you never heard of. And here, I've been involved with him for six years, and uh, everybody that lives in Great Falls has heard of him. But uh, no, the press never actually uh, published much on Edward Edwards when he finally got caught, and they refused to really follow his life after he got caught. And there, there's a reason for that, is that he taunted the press his whole life with letters from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way up to the end. And it was always about the editors. He would taunt the letters to the editors, and big letters he'd write on his envelopes, Dear Editor. Well, actually, the name Editor was a clue that it was Ed sending a letter. And he would steer the evidence through the press to go after innocent people. And the press would write the stories, and it would create frenzy. And... uh, Innocent people got executed, and dozens and dozens are sitting in prison or have sat in prison for life on his murders, attributed somewhat to the press that was given to the case. And so very early on, Edwards was able to create massive murders that got press, and the press destroyed innocent people, and that became his addiction. The rest of his life was just to create these horrific murders and we'll see if the press would destroy him and the public would destroy him. And so when he gets identified in 2010 as a serial killer, um, they never did many stories on him because it was them he was taunting his whole life. Crazy. And so did he... Now, that was another one I was asked. Now, I know you went out and visited the uh, police on the Avery family. Um, I guess it'd probably be uh, two months now. No, it's actually, it seems like it, yeah, but it, it was just, like it. Um, it, it was three weeks ago. Holy cow. It was just, yeah, it was just three weeks ago. I, I watched the, I watched the movie on Christmas Eve. I sat around for about a week or 10 days and I said, I'm going to Wisconsin. Um, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand what I saw going on in the press with that poor, uh, Avery family. Mrs. Avery is completely destroyed. She really is. And, even today, there's a big article in the paper about her, and she just wants to be left alone, and she doesn't even want to hear anything more about it. She just wants to be left alone. Yeah. And that's really the way she was when I visited with her. You could just tell she's got PTSD and doesn't understand what's going on. So yeah, yeah. it's really horrible. Edwards created this type of stuff throughout all of his murders, and uh, it just creates hatred. And yeah, yeah. With, with everybody screaming that Steve's innocent and Brendan is innocent, now what they're doing is going after the other ones they want to go after, such as Brendan's brothers, Steve's brothers, uh, Teresa Hallback's ex-boyfriend. You know, and that really was part of Edwards' plan all along. He knew that if he created a murder that didn't make sense like this and somebody innocent went down and all of a sudden it was controversial, people would start devouring each other. And that's what happened in all of them. And that's what seems to be playing out right now in the Avery case. Everybody's going after everybody, and it's really sad. Yeah, 
big divide and conquer and watch them all fall, I guess. Yeah, yeah and that's really what his mind process was. He knew, he's trying to repeat history. He's tr- he was trying to drag us down to the darkest times. That really was his thought process. He wanted to be known, you know, 10,000 years down the road as one of the most evil men ever, um, such as the ancient god uh, Osiris and Ra and Isis. You know, Isis is actually an ancient female god of fertility. And uh, now we have some of the worst killers in the world named Isis, and that's not, that's n- that's not a coincidence. Uh, basically, the thought process of them is kill the infidel, and that's what Edwards did. Wow. Yeah, actually, I, I remember that show when I was a kid. <laughs> Shazam Isis, but <laughs> that's giving away age here. But I, I remember that, and uh, it wasn't a good show anyway. But um, <laughs> the, um, the One of the questions, too, was uh, because you visited the Avery family, um, a lot of people did ask if you felt that Edward had worked his way into the family somehow, or if, if they were aware of him and uh, his past and uh, did, how they felt about the connection? Well, I didn't grill him about uh, the connection because uh, it was just so devastating to see what was going on in their salvage lot that day. Uh, the, the amount of calls they were getting was unbelievable, and some of them were really rude. Well, that's why I gave him my book. I have lots of pictures of Mr. Edwards in there and lots of information on him, but I didn't really want to question him in detail about whether or not they knew him. I did show him pictures, asked him if it looked familiar. Um, they didn't think so, but um, what Edwards would have done is groomed his way into Mr. and Mrs. Avery because they were the same age, and they ran the lot, and they're there every day. And uh, it's really an uh, open lot. It would have been very simple for Ed Edwards to walk in as a customer maybe a couple times, two or three times prior to the murder, looking for parts, but what he's really looking for is DNA, which is everywhere inside the uh, office. And, and the fact that the prosecutor is saying he couldn't have gotten his DNA it would have been simple as going into the bathroom and getting it out of the garbage or uh, getting it off a rag or getting it off a Steve Avery's T-shirt. You know, the underarm pit of a T-shirt is all you need to wipe the DNA on that hood latch. And the uh, blood splattered on the uh, key area of the car actually appears to be put with a Q-tip. It's just a very minute amount of blood. It didn't take a lot. And Steve had actually cut his hand prior to the murder and had blood and had left bloody rags around. And there were bloody rags around when I was in there because the guys all have cuts on their hands that work there. You're dealing with metal and crushing metal and crushing cars. So he just he simply groomed his way into the safe Avery family, unbeknownst to all of them, not knowing what he would be up to. That's all he had to do was find out when she was going to be there and and groom his way to make sure it was going to be on Halloween. Somehow, Ed Edwards got wind of that car going to be photographed on Halloween by Teresa Haldock, and it was simple as just grooming his way into life and listening. You don't even have to talk. You can just listen to what's going on and uh, find things out. And you and you said in the first show, I think that um, your thought was that he probably was on the road uh, roadway somewhere. It's pretty rural, and um, he flagged her down maybe when she was driving away after doing the pictures, and uh, he probably shot her in the head. Well, yeah, that's exactly how he had done it in the past. He uh, he would pull a ruse on a woman by either pulling up alongside of her and saying something's wrong with your car or, hey, can you help me, or or just be on the side of the road as an old man with a cane needing some help. And that area is really rural. I was out there. It was Halloween when she was shot. It was would, it would have been about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. Nobody would have even cared if there was a gunshot in that area because it's rural and it's just what they do. Um, but, yeah, she was shot in the left temple, which... It fits with her being the driver, sitting in the driver's seat. He would walk right up, shoot her in the left temple, take the car, and be gone. And have a pre-planned site. Everything would have been pre-planned. That's how he did it. So so now, one of the questions was that was response to that. Actually, and I got quite a few of them. And I kind of understand, um, but I'll let you answer it again. Their, their question was, why wasn't there a lot of blood splatter than in the truck? If he would have shot her... Um, in the truck, why wouldn't there have been blood all over? 
if he would have shot her with something larger than a twenty two, there would have been. But twenty twos that were a very common uh, gun that people killed themselves with as a, when I was a policeman, and they'd usually shot shoot themselves in the temple. And a twenty two, for the most part, never went through. It would go into the brain and zip around and kill you instantly. And you wouldn't bleed much, and you wouldn't leave much splatter either. But even if it did leave some splatter, he had three days with the car to plant it exactly how he wanted it. So, you know, people say, well, there was no blood on the windshield. There's no blood here. He took the car. He had it three days. Everything he did with that car was designed to set up Steve Avery. So the first thing he would do is to make sure his DNA was never going to be in it, clean it, and then plant everything. That's what Edwards would do. He never, very rarely left DNA. He left it once, and he got caught. That's what got him caught. We have never tied him his DNA to any other case, and that's because he planted others' DNA so obvious that even if he did leave minute amounts of DNA, they probably never got it because they were so concentrated on the obvious. So what was his background, uh, Edward Wayne Edwards, as in uh, for him to be smart enough to do this? Like, uh, where, where do you see that coming from? Well, he's probably one of those uh, kids that's just born a genius with an incredible high IQ. By the age of 12, 13, he's 132 IQ, but he's only got a sixth grade education. And he's a deviant, sexually deviant kid with an incredible intelligence and a charm. He was very charming and a memory that he, he remembered every detail of every murder he did. And you consider the hundreds of murders he did, he had them in his head. Um, and that shows in his psychiatric records from a very young age that he was brilliant. But he was using his brilliance to create crimes of recognition. And that's exactly what his psych record said in 1947. And what that meant was that he felt that nobody loved him, that nobody saw him, and nobody knew who he was because his name had been changed. And so he also had an identity crisis. He was sexually deviant and he was a serial killer. And so he basically taunted us our, his whole life with these horrible murders and his identity. Who am I? What's my name? And that's what it was always about in the letters. And uh, that's why that cryptic letter in the Teresa Halbach case is so important because the, the fact that they're calling it cryptic means there's puzzles in it. And all of his letters have puzzles and they contain his name. It's pretty interesting how uh, how he uh, how, how do you think he would find his crimes? Like how do you is it just from watching the news and just sort of like how did he latch on to the Avery family? Well, that is the simple. As Steve Avery was all over the press on nine eleven of two thousand three when he was released. He had spent eighteen years in prison. He was on national news. He was making news in Wisconsin. He was seen with the governor. They were making a law in his name. And Edwards had killed in Wisconsin before. And it just happened to be that Avery had that name that Edwards needed to tie it to Paul Avery, the San Francisco Chronicle reporter who got the Halloween card. That's really the first thing Edwards would have thought is, ah, I got a guy named Avery who did a bunch of time. So what's next? He plans two years. It actually was a two-year plan to kill on Halloween. And uh, that's how detailed he worked. So he would have groomed not only his way into Avery Salvage, but he would have attended St. John's Church so that Teresa Halbach would have seen him and would have become familiar with him. You know, the guy has a friendly face. And so if she saw him on the side of the road, she'd say, oh, that's, that's the guy that was in church. You know, he did that all the time. That's how it worked. Uh, what was the tie to the church for him? Like, was he was he fairly religious? Because um, you did mention you've mentioned it subtly, and also about the Satanism, and um, uh, and after the first show, I had uh, quite a few of the uh, uh, Church of Satan <laughs> um, send in notes uh, because they follow different um, paranormal shows. And their view of it was that uh, because they don't believe in God and they don't believe in Satan per se, that uh, he couldn't have been a Satanist. Yeah, he was the occult. You know, I I call it a Satanist, and there is a difference. But why he is what he is, is by the age of five, he witnesses his mother shot, and his name is changed, and he's placed in a Catholic orphanage by the age of six and seven. 
And by the age of eight, he's been raped and beaten and abused in a Catholic orphanage. He's been forced to participate in the Catholic rituals throughout the church. The nuns beat him. The priests uh, sexually assault him. And so he basically comes out at the age of 11 and 12 when he finally gets out of the orphanage and runs away and decides to start killing against religion as the rest of his life, but staging it on religious holidays and, and staging it out like uh, Catholic rituals. And so um, that's what he was. He was just evil, and he was against the Catholic Church or Christianity in general or any religion. But in a letter he sent in the Scott Peterson case in 2003, he, he details that he is the occult. And uh, you can see that on my website, Cold Case Cameron, November of 2003. There will be a letter there from Ed Edwards regarding his uh, attachment to the occult. How many, how many of these, now that's kind of another comment I get a lot. How many of these cases um, do you think he was involved with that are quite popular? Um, more so than... Uh, some of his other ones that he did, um, uh, like because you well, he would he would average about ten a year, and he did it for sixty six years. And out of those ten a year, usually at least one or two would be really big. You know, would get a lot of recognition. Some of them didn't get quite what he had hoped for, and what he would usually do is go back, and sometimes it would be thirty, forty years later, and start stirring the evidence towards somebody with letters. And so he was always trying to create recognition in all of his murders, but he has dozens and dozens of murders that everyone would would know about um, that he committed over the last sixty years. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the one of the um, more common of the more negative comments I I got on it. Uh, but for me, I would think that uh, he he obviously was attracted to cases that had fame. Uh, you know, yeah, like, recognition. Like this one. Yeah, like he looked for it, and it was already on the news. For instance, like the Steve Avery had already gained attention. Uh, so yeah, you, you know what I think. If if your listeners actually ever wanted to read why he did this, Edwards's book is on my website on the homepage for free download as a PDF file, and you can read his book that he wrote. And you'll hear throughout it him saying, "I'm in the crime for recognition. I'm in the crime for recognition." And nobody really understood it. But that's really what it was. His crimes were recognized. They were everywhere. Yeah, and that, and also with the letters, um, uh, someone had also written in that uh, you mentioned about Teresa's name was in his book a number of times. So how do you correlate that? Like, what's, what's the significance to her name being mentioned? Well, what the investigation showed after I before I published the book was that Edwards tied all of his murders that he did after he published his book to names, dates, places, states in his book. And so the state of Wisconsin was mentioned, and a girl named Teresa, who he actually dated in 1955 before he came here to Montana, was in there. And he hated Teresa, and he was never able to kill Teresa. But Teresa almost got him caught here in Montana. And uh, so that was just another name tied to the Halback case. He needed to kill somebody named Teresa. And Teresa, in his book, is about the same age as Teresa Halback. So that's how he did it. Um, and that's what, why he came to Great Falls, Montana, and killed in 1956. He wrote an entire chapter of My Hometown in the book and detailed the killing um, as a parable in the book. And... Uh, that turned out to be true of the whole book. Every name in there, he is killed. Um, just to give you a clue, at the very beginning of his book, he, he congratulates the woman that helped him type the book named Mrs. Coleman. And then he goes and kills Christopher Coleman and his whole family in uh, uh, Illinois in 2009. So the book's all like that. Every one of his murders that he committed are somehow tied to his book, and that's what the plan was, that once somebody figured him out, they could put the puzzle together, and it was always about the writings. Just just amazing. How, how did he do most of his killings? You were talking about um, he kind of did it all to them, like gun, fire, stabbing, everything? Yeah, but the, the, there was a couple of 
particular murders that he would do, that he would commit complete terror. And that was the killing of couples in their car or on beaches or wherever they were. And that was because his parents, he never knew his father. His mother was in prison and came out and basically disowned him and then was killed. He was killing his parents over and over and over again for six decades by sneaking up on people in their cars having sex, ordering them out, terrorizing them, I mean, horrible stuff, and then killing them so they couldn't create him. So how did he get caught eventually? Well, in 2009, his daughter was watching a cold case uh, out of uh, Wisconsin on TV, and it was a kidnapping of a couple on a lover's lane in 1980. And it happened to occur on the anniversary of his mother's death, and that's one thing that he always ties it to, is to a specific date that ties to him. And he kidnapped men and stabbed them and tied them up and tortured them. And uh, his daughter watched the show and called the police shortly after and said, I think I was living in here when my dad took us to this murder. And he, in fact, had taken his daughter and two little boys to the scene of a double murder and claimed that he found them, when in fact what he had actually done was put them there, brought his kids to the scene, and was the helper. And uh, that's what did him in. In 2009, his daughter turned him in. The cops go down to Louisville, Kentucky. They find him with his wife living in a trailer. They take his DNA, and it matches. Then he's busted in 2009. Then in 2010, he finally gets identified as a serial killer after confessing to five murders spanning 20 years in two states. And uh, a year later, he dies. And that's probably a lot of reason why nobody ever heard of him, because it hadn't unraveled yet. It didn't really unravel until now. And so he died in prison. Yeah, he died in uh, Ohio on April 7th, 2011, of uh, natural causes. He was going to be executed August 31st, 2011. Well, it's too bad he missed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody says. I'll pull it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, well, it no, actually, uh, yeah. I was scheduled to go visit with him uh, five days, and then he, he died five days before I got out there. Oh, that's too bad. That would have been really interesting. Plus, you'd get a feel for the person, for the character. You'd kind of get, you know... Um, yeah, you know, when, when I think back to that interview, I had interviews with him on the phone, and I don't think I would have got much more out of the personal interview one-on-one, -on -one, but yeah, it would have been really neat, you know, to be in the yeah. same room with him. But yeah. um, his whole goal with myself and my friend that helped on this wasn't to just admit all this to us. He was leading us to certain puzzles that we hadn't figured out yet because we were really kind of in his face the first few months going, aha, we got you. And he would always write us back and say, you just don't know the whole story, John. And he'd give more, more cryptic uh, puzzles in his letters to us. And that's what the whole thing ended up being is just him leading us to make sure we open our eyes because there's a lot more to it than all that we knew. And that was six years ago. And about every month, it's a new revelation. And, and actually, since the Avery case, there's a couple of cases that have come forward with, that he did that are just unbelievable, and most people will know him. Oh, so he's got more under his belt, so to speak. Yeah, probably the, the, the most important one that came forward is the girl named Darley Rotier out of uh, Roulette, Texas, who 20 years ago now was sentenced to death for killing her six-year-old son, her five-year-old in bed while they slept and uh, it was an Edwards murder um, I had been notified of this murder about a year ago but after my interviews on radio the last week people came forward with lots more evidence and uh, he definitely set up Darby Rotier in Rolette, Texas who is on death row right now and about to be executed and she's done 20 years now yeah you know um, it's just it's really strange uh, no and another question about Edwards of course was um how did he get by traveling so much, and uh, what did he do for money for all those years? Yeah, in the last uh, 15 years of his life, he chartered private planes. And for money, he actually insured people and killed them and collected and created uh, false uh, insurance claims, burned down houses, collected money, uh, robbed banks, uh, burglarized constantly, was a safe cracker was a check kiter, 
everything he did was he stole his kids' money from his wrestling team. That's how bad this guy was. <laughs> he he was the coach of the wrestling team and took all the wrestling money and split town. <laughs> but no, that's he was a thief. And that's why he didn't get caught, because most serial killers are sexually deviant and have an attraction to something that's going to get them caught. He was a criminal, and doing everything for criminal right, setups and all of that. So it was never... If, if he thought for one minute he'd get caught, he, he was capable of saying, oh, I'm not going to do this one. And uh, just to give a really neat story, I just, these two boys called me a couple days ago that knew Ed Edwards, 1978 in Ohio. And they were out uh, bird hunting in a field. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes Ed Edwards with a double barrel shotgun, shoves it into their belly, screams at them, what are you doing here? But all of a sudden, a car drives by. And he switched from being the most evil-looking, I'm going to kill you, to the nicest person in the world, invited him into their house, into his house, and gave him copies of his book and told them how bad he used to be. And those boys, they know now how close they came to dying. But that story was incredible. They were only 16 years old when that happened in 1977. Wow. They must they must feel lucky now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did. That's why they called me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, so, and so do you think he was a well-liked guy then? Everybody loved him. That's the one thing that everybody, everybody knew him. You know, he's almost like the, the uncle you just got to like. <laughs> but he also wasn't, a, he wasn't, he was just attractive, and he was a good-looking guy, and he was smooth, and he was very well-spoken. He could pull off the doctor roots. He could pull off being a policeman. He could pull off the preacher ruse all the way down to wearing a collar and be the sweetest, nicest man. And you wouldn't have thought any different until the black eyes come out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so how did he um, get away with it with his family and, you know, his wife and his kids? That seemed to be another common uh, question. Well, he actually used them as a ruse. You know, he... He didn't kill in front of them, um, but he was horrible, and they, you know, he was abusive. Um, he he would actually uh, put a gun to his head sometimes when he was going to get self pity, and threaten to kill himself in front of his kids, and that's just really power and control. He had stabbed his wife years and years ago and refused to let her go to the hospital and fixed her himself. He had complete control, and the kids were just kids living with the mom and dad. Dad was never home. And dad especially was never home on holidays. And that's what really became important early on when I went and visited the kids in 2010. And I asked him, where's your dad on Christmas? He was never around on Christmas because he was always killing on Christmas. Yeah, his family was religious. His family is beautiful. And he was Satan. That really is how he worked. He just used them as the alibi and the police would show up and say, was Dad home? They'd have to say yes, because if they said no, they wouldn't be around. Yeah, so do you think that they were aware of it, or the wife, now he had two wives, do you think they were aware of what happened or what he was doing when he wasn't home? Not the wife that he was with for 43 years, but the wife that he was with in 1955-56 for that eight-month period knew exactly what he was doing, but couldn't do anything about it. That's how in control he was. Um, she was afraid of him more than anything, and he basically terrorized her her whole life, you know, with false letters and threats that if you ever told anybody, I'm going to kill our son or I'm going to kill you. So when I talked to her in 2011, um, she had never told anybody because she's still alive and her son's still alive, and that she was more afraid of him and than the FBI or anybody. Wow, that's just uh, quite bizarre. What What are your thoughts now in the, in the last couple of weeks since all of the um, talk and, and uh, things going on? Have you changed any of your views? Well, no, it actually just seems to be ballooning into another time, and that's how this has always played out. It's always about timing. Um, the Avery case, I had no idea it was going to be thrown in my lap like this. 
And now since that has been thrown in, now these other cases are coming up that are just as horrible as Steve Avery and only adding to the terror this man caused. So really the whole purpose that all I'm going to do is work to get social media to get these people out because I can tell you our system isn't going to do it until we get enough people on board social media-wise to demand they do it. And that's the only way it's going to work because for six years I tried to get the system to do it and they act just like they do in that documentary, Making a Murderer. So do you think that, uh, so you don't think it's ever going to go well um, for Avery or the the nephew? No, I'm optimist, but I've been an optimist for six years, and there's still, you know, ten guys sitting in prison that I know are completely innocent on his murders, and the system has said, screw you, basically. But it's different now. The Avery case has really opened it up, and I really think that that was what it was all about. And uh, we got a good look at what really happens behind the justice system, and that's really the only reason those two women did that documentary, because they wanted to show what goes on behind the scenes. And they did. And now they're getting crucified by the prosecution. Well, sorry, that's what goes on. I've been in murder trials, lots of them, and that is what goes on. And that is what sometimes the way police act and prosecutors act and defense act. That's how it plays out. And uh, if you're in an Ed Edwards setup, you are screwed. And so do you think that, um, do you think the system can really change? I think that one of the most, I don't know, I'd say um, maybe relevant things of, of the documentary is the way that the justice system went and how it, how they, how people can see it more from the inside. And I think they're really, um, I don't know if disgust it's the word, but they're really, they're certainly upset about it. Do you think that that will actually make some some changes in the system? Well, if you think back on what Ed Edwards did, you know, like all the way back to 1954 when he set up Dr. Sam Shepard for killing his wife, that case became the catalyst for legal and the way the press should treat murder uh, trials and the way we should control trials so we don't have all this outside influence to the jury from the press. And that was 1954. And here we are in 2016 arguing the exact same problem that's been going on for 60 years. The only way it's going to change is through the Internet. It really is. And through people coming together and, and supporting all of these people that are in prison, not just Steve Avery, but all of them, and, uh, and demanding our officials do something. And it seems like it, it, I feel it's working. I sense that something's changed in the last month. Yeah, it, it maybe it maybe in future tense. I don't know about um, something happening past tense because I just feel like uh, uh, you know, like the um, sheriff and the uh, police officers that were being deposed, and they were definitely involved in the first mistrial and purposefully. Uh, even uh, Michael Griesbach, the current you know uh, district attorney there. Uh, was trying to, um, you know, brought it to the attorney general. Was hoping that they would get, uh, uh, you know, brought to, to justice for that. And of course, it was just passed on. They did nothing. Um, I think that's that's probably another thing that's pretty upsetting. Well, it's the opening of Pandora's box because what happens is once one of these guys gets out and it's exposed that Ed Edwards was the setup. It destructs the system all the way back. How many other people did he set up that we don't know about? How many people are sitting in with their DNA at the scene of a murder and they're going, I don't know how my DNA got there. It's Pandora's box. And so it's much easier for the officials that are in the positions to actually do something to just say, oh, God, we're not touching this. That's, that's exactly what they say, too, and I've heard it. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the other um, questions was about the um, actual evidence itself and the, the blood in that. And um, uh, had a lot of people asking how you think Edwards would have been able to determine whose blood was who. Do you think he actually knew Steve Avery? Yeah, he would have definitely stood in front of Steve Avery under assumed identity. You know, just being a customer or if Steve hung out at a bar, having a beer at a bar next to him, or Steve hung out at a strip club. Edwards always hung out in those places to, 
to groom his way and his victims just to talk to them. And it would be nothing. But, you know, Steve cut his hand. He clearly had a large cut on his hand. He bled prior to the murder, days prior to the murder. He left blood. Um, and it was just as simple as getting the one bloody rag sitting in the in the uh, trash can. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just have to be a part of it, really, um, to get get in there. And um, and no, and another one was about the Avery family itself again. Going back now, would Edward send people letters like families? Yeah, yeah, he always did. In fact, in the Doctor Sam Shepard case in 1954, if you go on my website, read the letters he sent. Uh, poor Dr. Sam Shepard's father. And that's exactly a cryptic letter that Edwards would send. Um, he taunted Patsy Ramsey for five years through email anonymously and basically drove her to her death by giving her the details of how he killed her. And that's how, that's how evil he was. He, he had no conscience. And his whole goal was to keep killing and get the highest count and keep setting people up. So do you think the Avery family will eventually get a letter from him? Do you think he, or he would have died maybe and didn't send them? Or no, they have letters. They they received a bunch of letters um, right after Steve was arrested, and that's really why I went out there. I really wanted to get those letters, but they were such a mess, and all of their files are a mess, and they couldn't tell me where anything was, and I just didn't want to push them at that point. But they did receive letters, and so did Steve, and so did the sheriff. And uh, that's exactly who we would send them to. Now, as for the press, I haven't heard of any letters sent to the press, but the press doesn't really have to divulge that information if they don't want to. Yeah. And and so, and and you attempted to talk to the police when you were there, didn't you? Yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> Behind the glass wall. I mean, basically, I, I couldn't get anywhere, which is a shame. If they would have given me five minutes of their time, that letter would have been brought up. And that, and I could have just shown them, but then that would really throw everything into a, a stir. There, they didn't want to hear it. They just didn't want to hear it. Well, and so, so what do you think that's about? Do you think that they just don't want to? Uh, they're getting too much, or they just don't want to deal with anything new, or they want it all to yeah. go away? I guess. Yeah, it's called circling the wagons and covering your butt from liability, because this is all about liability. Edward Edwards was on federal parole from 1967 to 1977. He was being supervised by a federal parole officer while he killed 100 people or more all over the country and ran around claiming he was reformed. So the liability alone of the federal government on him is enormous. So now take into consideration each and every jurisdiction that maybe budged a little bit on the case to make it work, you know? And do we know where Edwards was living at the time of the uh, Avery killing? Well, he lived in so many places. He had just moved to Louisville, Kentucky, right around 2006. Prior to that, he had been in Arizona. He had been in Ohio. He had been in Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, um, living, actually, in these places. But he had traveled to every state. He would basically do a complete travel around the country on a regular basis. Every waking moment of his life was about his murders and setting people up. Well, so where do you see yourself going now? Are you are you planning to, uh, I mean, you're saying that there's some new um, maybe cases about Edwards. Are you planning on doing a follow-up book or um, uh, an update on it? You know, I'd love to do a follow-up book, but, man, that's a lot of work writing a book. So what I've really been doing is updating my website and putting as many of the murders that I can say Ed Edwards did and the evidence on my website, coldcasecameron.com. That way people can have the information, because that really is what the purpose of this is, is to get the information out there so others can see it, because once you read it and see it, it's so obvious that it's kind of like a big puzzle. So I have people all over just obsessed with it now, and it's kind of, they're the ones coming up with the murders, and they're right. And so I just see this going on for years, because it's, I actually wrote at the end of my book that I knew this would take decades to unravel, and it will take decades to unravel. So how many murders do you think he committed? Well, he averaged six, uh, 10 a year for 66 years, and that would probably be right, right about in that area is how many he had committed. So six He actually announced his count 500 in 1997, so that's about right, 600, 
660. And out of those, one quarter would usually go down in a wrongful conviction or be destroyed by the system, accused, or they would kill themselves, or Edwards would taunt them to their death. Um, so it was always about not only the kill, but the setup. And the numbers, 500, include the setups. You know, as a Zodiac killer, he kept sending these counts. I've killed one, I've killed three, I've killed seven, I've killed 38. But those actually weren't who he killed. Those counts were actually who he set up. And that's why everybody was confused about the Zodiac's count. Wow, that's crazy. What, what is you? You know, so you have a website. Um, let's let's give that to people so they can go there and uh, see what you put up for uh, evidence. Yeah, the website's coldcasecameron.com, and it actually contains every audio and video and court record and letter that Edwards wrote. I've got many, many more to put on there, but it's a complete timeline of his life, all the killings, all the setups, and you could just follow his life from 1933 all the way up until today. Did you, did you also put the link of the uh, Making a Murder um, Episode 6 up there as well? You know, I don't think I put that on my website yet, but that is on YouTube, and I think that's all you got to search. Somebody else put that out there. Right, yeah, it's kind of all over the place. Um, it's just amazing. Um, so, oh, and, and did you ever uh, get to talk to Avery himself about this, or has he heard about this, and have you heard anything back? I sent him a really detailed letter before I even went out to Wisconsin because I just wanted him to know, and I also had some questions for him um, regarding Mr. Edwards. And then he got, uh, I went out to Wisconsin, actually, and I was going to attempt to visit him, but then uh, he got the attorney, Kathleen Zellner, and they're going to re represent him. So I was hoping to hear from him by letter. Um, so he would have got my letter probably around January 3rd or 4th. So it's been close to a month, and I have not heard from him, but... Um, I did speak with his mom and dad and brothers and sisters. So, wow. Now, so, Edwards, I have to also, um, I know a lot of people talked about this, and I just wanted to check with you because we didn't talk about this. Was He was a boy murderer as well, and he killed animals? Yeah, he actually uh, completely dismembered animals when he was young. He blew up a barn by fire when he was seven. He would call the police and have them sent to uh, fires that he had lit, and then he'd stand back and watch. And this is all before he's 12. So he was uh, he loved to watch the fire trucks and the police cars show up at the crime he created and then stand and watch when he was little. And that became what he did the rest of his life. Now, did he, did he write about this in his first book? Is this what you get when you read his book? Yeah, it's exactly. You gotta read, you gotta read it because it's just incredible knowing who he is now. He detailed every bit of who he was. He detailed how a serial killer was made. And that's why it was called Metamorphosis of a Criminal. What it really was was Metamorphosis of the most evil serial killer ever. Well, what and, made him, uh, what made him write that book? This was done in what, 1972? Yeah, it was the solution to the Zodiac case. You know, the Zodiac case happened in 68, 69, 70, and then he announced himself in 1970 claiming, if you solve this puzzle, you'll know who I am. And then he published the book, and the book was the solution. And so he ran around the country basically handing out his solution to all his murders in this book, bragging that he was reformed when, in fact, he was killing the closest people. Oh, did, did, but did nobody recognize that at the time? No, that's what's unbelievable. You know, go online and watch him in 1972 on To Tell the Truth, a game show. <laughs> and it's 15 minutes of a very smooth serial killer fooling everybody in America. <laughs> no, I, I actually used to watch that To Tell the Truth when I was 12, 11 years old, and I kind of always wonder if I ever saw that one. It would be easy to be fooled. He was charming, smart, and he, he looked convincing. That's amazing. Well... We've come to the close of an, another great hour. Um, let's give out now your book. It's called It's Me. Um, give out your contact information so people can uh, tell you what they think or maybe if they have questions. Yeah, sure. My website is coldcasecameron.com. I'm also on Facebook, Cold Case Cameron. I'm also on Facebook, John A. Cameron. And uh, my book is called It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, The Serial Killer You Never Heard Of. 
and it's available on Amazon and on my website. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for um, talking again about this and uh, and helping people with some of the answers. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Alan. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. If you're lying to me, I'll be back.